Hi, this is 365801 and this is a reviewing LGBTQIA plus YA video and this is for Icebreaker. Now I have been trying to read a bit more YA and the very first LGBTQIA plus YA that I read last year was The Passing Playbook which had a queer romance between two male characters and also had a sports theme and Icebreaker is very much the same. Now A.L. Grazia Day's Icebreaker is a YA debut that also has a male male romance and is sports themed. This time however it's not uh, football, it is the NHL. Now I have been reading a ton of NHL themed male male romance and I wanted to see how that uh, setting would be handled in a YA context. Now I listened to the audiobook version of this story, this was narrated by Tom Picasso. Uh, this was released in January, so this is a 2022 release, so very very recent. Uh, so if you're interested I would recommend checking out the audiobook version as that's how I consumed it and I enjoyed it a lot. Now Icebreaker follows 17 year old Mickey James III who is a college freshman, a brother to five sisters and a hockey legacy. With a father and a grandfather who has gone down in NHL history, Mickey is almost guaranteed the league's top draft spot. The only person standing in his way is Jason Caulfield, a contender for the number one spot, and Mickey's infuriating and infuriatingly attractive teammate. When rivalry turns to something more, Mickey will have to decide what he really wants and what he's willing to risk for it. This is a story about falling in love, finding your team on and off the ice, and choosing your own path. Now, although the summary mainly focuses on the rivalry between the two main characters and their romance, there is a lot more going on underneath the surface and I think the book deals with and handles a lot of other issues as well, some of which I end up thinking are the real pros of the book rather than just the romance. So when I'm talking about the pros, even though this is a YA debut, which is always something that I look for and want, um, the fact that it's a male-male romance story, which I obviously look for and want, uh, the fact that it is a sports-based story and it's ice hockey and NHL, which I obviously have been enjoying a lot, the first thing I would say is the pro of this book is the mental health rep. Mickey's struggle with depression and anxiety and feeling emotions or any emotion at all is really well handled and it was so nice to see how it's handled in a very realistic way from someone who does have depression and anxiety and and I would say you know the triple threat of stress too you know the triple threat being to myself <laughs> it was nice to see how it was represented in someone who is supposed to have a lot of privilege, who's supposed to have it all, who's got his life sorted out, who is the pinnacle, who is successful, who is able to uh, garner um, lots of amazing press and uh, great support from random people in the street because of who he is and yet deep down inside there is something going on and he is struggling and it was really nice for me as the reader to see that struggle and to understand what was going on inside his head and also to see how he wasn't coping in terms of the work at the college or the stress of teammates and settling in and meeting people and making friends and also how he was coping in unhealthy ways with alcohol. All of these factors really did help to make this book not really necessarily about romance but more about um, mental health and I really appreciated seeing someone who was not coping <laughs> even though they are supposed to be and the fact that they feel guilt about not coping even though they are supposed to be. So there was a lot of layers to uh, Mickey's 
mental health and I liked the fact that we were seeing this in a young male character and I hope that other young men will be able to read this story and see themselves and see that maybe there is a way that they can cope and get help and I thought that was super positive. The second thing that I think the book does really well is discuss privilege and the difference between the two main characters. Mickey obviously has a lot of privilege. He comes from a background of ice hockey with his grandfather and his father being the Mickey James name and he has that name that he can fall back on or he can utilise. He also has that name to open doors for him so he can get the best coaches, go to the best training camps, get the money for it. All of these things help and support him towards his goal. He gets a scholarship to the college so he doesn't even have to worry about money and finances to be able to go to this college that he doesn't want to be at. And that's where there's another element of tension between him and Jason, the other main character, who is a black ice hockey player, which is a rarity, who doesn't come from a background of ice hockey playing and doesn't have that leg up. He also fully recognises that there will be someone out there who could have had that spot at college and who would be more benefiting of the scholarship than Mickey. And so there are tensions there and discussions about privilege. And I thought that was something that was really well discussed throughout the book. It was very entertaining to see quite realistic um, but heartwarming sibling interactions when it comes to his older sisters and their group chats and how they interacted with each other and supported each other. Uh, they really took on that sort of nurturing uh, parental role for uh, Mickey and I think that was really nice to see him take on some bonds when he finally was able to make friends with his teammates especially with Darian and Barbie and the fact that he had both his family bonds and his found family. His great friendship with Nova was also I think super super important that there was someone else there who was within and without so that he could bounce back. I think it was important for the story to have her be part of it um, and so it was a really nice aspect to the story as a whole. Now this wouldn't be an NHL story and it wouldn't be an NHL male male romance story without some sort of reference towards discrimination, specifically sexual discrimination and this is Something that you can totally understand when you do a quick Google search, which I did, to find out how many out players are there in the NHL. And it's a very, very small number, like one hand. You could count them on one hand. And so you can totally understand uh, Mickey's um, hesitancy towards coming out and, you know, fear of what the consequences might be. However, what I also liked about this book is how... Um, it dealt with other aspects of discrimination, whether it be racial discrimination for Jason or gender discrimination for Mickey's siblings and the fact that there is a raft of ways that sports and specifically NHL can do better. It wasn't done in um, an overly preachy sort of way, it was just woven naturally into the story and you came away feeling a little bit more uplifted, like the kids are all right, they're gonna be okay, because if it's not now, it will be. We will make this a better world. So there was an uplifting aspect to this story, um, and I really appreciated that. Now I'm putting this pro here at the end, that is Rivals to Lovers, and the reason I'm putting it at the end is because even though it was kind of billed as the main plot of this book, it gets people in, it's a YA debut, it's sports, it's male male romance, it's rivals to lovers, like sign me up, I'm ticking boxes here. Um, this was actually like the least important point of the book, I have to say, in terms of the way I was reading it. There were other things that were done uh, better and I guess that's why it's a YA rather than um, a male male romance. Rival to lovers, you got me. You got me. 
and I have to say their rivalry could have lasted even longer. Like I love the tension, I love the snarkiness, I love the the nasty comments. I wanted even more of it. Um, but what I absolutely loved was the holding hands and staring into each other's eyes and having to say mean things and nice things. I loved that scene. It was so well done. I could have had an extra, I don't know, like 10 pages of it. It was so good. Um, the tension. Oh, the tension. Um, so yeah, things like that really, really help make this even better. So all of the other aspects that I've just discussed were really good, but the rival syllabus is like the icing on the top rather than the actual cake. Um, but you know, what's cake if not to have a bit of icing on top, you know? I want the icing. Uh, give me the icing. Um, there was some really cute, sweet moments between the two of them and their gradual change from being these rivals to being two people who care deeply about each other um, really was heartening. It did mean that the ending was focused more on and I have to say I'm not going to talk too much about the ending but just to say that a lot of people have said that they really enjoyed this book up until the end and then the end felt uh, unfinished or underdeveloped uh, or a bit more like a cliffhanger and they didn't really appreciate the way that it ended. I thought the ending was okay and that's probably why I'm giving it the rating I'm giving it. But I felt that the actual romance between the two was not the main point of this book. I'm not sure if the author <laughs> decided that or if the publishers decided that. Personally, I think everything else was the point of the book. The Rivals to Lovers was just the icing on the cake. Although I do have to say that someone on Goodreads wrote the best review of this book, which is if a rivalry last longer than seven years, then you are no longer rivals. You are gay. And I thought that just basically sums up their relationship. Um, it was a cute, sweet relationship and it was nice to just go along with. Parts of this book were just your cute, sweet rivals to lovers. And part of this book was um, very much about um, the stresses of NHL draft. <laughs> So when it comes to giving a rating for this book, it's probably no surprise that it's not a full five stars, but uh, just a four. I do think that all of the aspects like the mental health, the discrimination, found family, um, the privilege discussions, all of these things really built this up to be more than just the romance. The romance became secondary and I'm feeling more and more when I'm reading YA, especially YA with male male romance, that it is always secondary to something else. Um, and so that was also kind of the, the difference between what I'm discovering about sort of male male romance versus YA that have a male male romance aspect to it is that I'm reading male male romance for the romance and there will be all these other aspects but the romance is up there it's like the top tier pro one 100% is these two guys get it on and because it's an adult rather than a YA you know you're getting some smutty spicy stuff and I'm here for that so that is the big takeaway from this that I would, for example, recommend if you liked Icebreaker as a YA, but you're looking for something like an adult story, um, the understatement of the year. Is that Serena Bowen? Uh, I listened to it in an audiobook through Audible and oh my goodness, like that was a fantastic NHL spicy, spicy adult male male romance that also had a lot of other aspects to it. It was like talking about discrimination, it was talking about family feuds and and it had, uh, you know, friends, old friends to lovers and it had uh, mental health aspects as well. There was a lot going on in that story and I felt like that was a really, really well done book as well. I'm not giving a, a review for it here, but still, it was great and it was it felt to me like that was the adult version of this story. Like this is the YA version and that's the adult version. 
Um, so yeah, there was definitely tonal difference. And I'm starting to realise that when it comes to YA, the tonal difference is uh, that the focus ne isn't necessarily on the romance. It's very much on the other aspects that are giving main characters uh, some sort of tension or conflict. And so it's interesting to read these YA books in uh, at around the same time as reading male male romance adult books. They're very different, <laughs> but they're good in similar ways. So yeah, if you have read Icebreaker and you enjoyed it and you want something a bit spicier, then The Understatement of the Year is a really good book. Um, check that one out too. <laughs> and vice versa, vice versa. If you've read The Understatement of the Year and you're like, huh, this is quite an interesting one. Should I read it? Yes. Have a go at this YA um, debut. It was very, very entertaining. Um, so yeah, uh, giving it four stars, I think, is um, an appropriate one. Just because there were a few aspects to it that I felt like, mm, and I do think that the ending, I wouldn't say it was disappointing. I just felt like it was rushed a little. And I felt like possibly, possibly the author didn't write exactly what was wanted by the author. Perhaps uh, the editor had more of an influence. I don't know. Who's to say? But it wasn't quite what I think a lot of readers were after. That's not to say it was a bad ending, it was a perfectly acceptable ending. <laughs> but perfectly acceptable doesn't get you five stars from me, sorry. So it's a four star for me, which is still very, very good and very, very high. So yeah. So if you've read Icebreaker, let me know what you think. And um, if you have any NHL recs, whether they're YA or spicy, spicy, male, male, you know I'm in the market for those. Uh, let me know in the comments down below as well. Um, thanks for watching to the end. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. I am 365801 and I make videos on male, male romance, BL manga, yaoi and all that good stuff. Take care everyone. I'll see you in the next video. Bye!